So uh, Sandra will uh, follow, and uh, Sandra is an artist, and she's showing work downstairs as well. Um, and she's researching the influence of the technosphere on evolutionary processes, and with a distinct artistic scientific methodology, she decentralizes the anthropogenic perspective by reinterpreting the landscape through its materiality. And uh, Sandra is uh, developing and leading the MA um, Ecology Futures at the Master Institute of Visual Cultures, uh, a used school of art and design in the Netherlands. I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. And also also sees a researcher and in the Connected Bio-Based Art um, and Design Research Group, Center of Applied Art, uh, Research and Technology in the Netherlands, uh, innovating uh, eco-critical discourse and biotech methods uh, in education. Um, she's also an associated researcher at uh, Critical Media Lab, uh, University of Applied Sciences and Arts, um, Northwestern Switzerland, co-leading the discussion group Planetary Ecologies, uh, addressing critical environmentalists and intersectional metabolics. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And Sandra will be talking about her, uh, she will be sharing her practice and uh, yeah, uh, themes that she's exploring around um, pollution in the ocean and uh, yeah, impact on marine life. Thank you so much, Sandra. Welcome. All right, so Irini, thank you so much for having me in this exhibition and inviting me. Um, and I'm very happy to be here as well. So thank you for uh, Janis and Helena for the warm welcome here at Neme and Cyprus in general. Um, yeah, I'd like to take my presentation time today to explore the role of artistic practice in knowing the sea otherwise. I'm interested in how artistic research can generate other ways of knowing and understanding beyond the anthropogenic perspective. Um, and my project serves as a way of learning by doing. So I'll be discussing two projects that are not situated here in the Mediterranean Sea, but in the North Sea, because I'm from the Netherlands. So to understand the North Sea and its cultural context, one must know this. In the Netherlands, the landscape is considered a non-fixed entity that can be utilized, adjusted, reshaped, and reworked. The North Sea is a continental flat, so once it was land, and what is now considered the Netherlands was part of it. At the end of the last ice age, seawater level rose and flooded the majority of land. Since then, the Dutch have renegotiated what is land and what is water on an ongoing basis, marked by land reclamation and exploitation. Every part of land and sea is accounted for, measured, divided, and assigned a purpose. In the last 150 years, technological development has increasingly enabled the Dutch to form and uphold this attitude, earning us the questionable reputations as masters of the water. Starting with winning non-renewables from offshore fields as early as 1959, exploitation and infrastructure in the North Sea has drastically increased in the last decade with the urgent quest for renewable energy. And so this Dutch mindset becomes tangible to anyone from my generation, seeing the empty horizons change into, be, into them being lined with windmills, the boat trip through the busy canal being marked by moving in between of infrastructure. Bathymetry and sonar technologies mapped out the former land, now seabed, as well as the water column. The border between land and water is thus considered nothing but a cross-section of matter, nothing but a set of densities to move through. It's a carefully crafted story of technological development, progress, and victory. Yet through the cracks and from the deep, in the enmeshed, attention field is always on the verge of bursting. Those whose stories have been overwritten and left unheard leave their marks regardless to those who are there to hear them. And so I ask, is there a way to know the sea otherwise? The North Sea is now one of the busiest seas in the world, yet it's also one of the most hostile and inaccessible waters. Who has access and how, and what effects anthropogenic activity has below the waves, is all very relative and available to a very limited number of people. So my first step then was to find a way to gain access to the sea and to aim for a result that could provide a more holistic view on the sea as an entity. As sound travels five times faster through water compared to air, it was my hypothesis that it would offer valuable understanding of the activity of both man, but also aquatic life and elemental and planetary movement over a vast distance. So at first I searched for existing recordings at Wageningen Marine Researchers, who are my project partner and they're the main um, research facility in the Netherlands. However, except for a few sample recordings, there was not much there. 
Sound is recorded not for listening, but for data analysis. It is displayed as a schematic and filtered on spikes that stand out from the norm range. Original recordings were not often stored. No sounds were openly accessible. There was no central database. So I decided to make my own field recordings. You must know that hydrophone recordings are often taken either from the shore or from a boat hanging down. And that means that most recordings capture sound of the surface, of the shoreline, or the sounds of the boat they are uh, deployed from. And I did not want that. I wanted to come closer to what actual sound was there when nobody was around. So I found a company that was willing to make me a custom device that could be attached to something, either a structure on the seafloor or a buoy or anything else, and that had enough battery power to last for a 24-hour recording cycle. Though I was not allowed to join any surveys or boats, so I couldn't go out there myself, I did find a researcher willing to take charge of deployment. The Pelagia, a famous Dutch research vessel, thus went out, attached my hydrophone free-floating to a lander that could sit on the seafloor independently and deployed it as such. Their research took them on a big round trip, so they left to return days later and pick up the hydrophone. And I listened to the resulting recordings on, for days on end. At one point, a storm passed over. At another, the clicks of dolphins chatting were audible. Things bumped into the hydrophone. But by far, most sounds were unmistake, unmistakably linked to anthropogenic activity. Ships towing of fishing vessels over the seafloor, and even the thumping sound of driving poles in the seafloor was there, which remains a mystery as today, because no such activity was known to take place in the vicinity. So the recording uh, must have picked up something from very far away. And I made a composition balancing the general background noise, which are actually water, molecule, water molecules rushing, and the more remarkable or recognizable sounds, uh, keeping the sound as close to its original recordings as possible. It was programmed over eight channels so the sound could travel through the space, and the speakers were aimed up to a reflection screen so the sound hugs you when you're standing in the circle. And then it was opening night, and the exhibition was very well visited. And yet, my space was mostly empty all night. So that wasn't exactly what you hoped to achieve. And so I started casually to ask, uh, casually starting, um, I started to casually uh, asking around. And as it turns out, visitors could hardly stand to be in the space. The vibrations of the anthropogenic noise were so uncomfortable in such a visceral way that they left. And this was all like in, in 2015 and 16 when, uh, you know, attention for underwater noise it just didn't exist really. So years later, I joined the Embassy of the North Sea, which is an initiative built on the legacy of Bruno Latour in striding for non-human rights. In this case, the rights uh, for the North Sea to become its own uh, entity, recognized as its own entity. By now, anthropogenic noise was recognized as one of the nine main polluters of the sea. And the Dutch government participated in the meantime in a European scientific project, mapping out what areas of the European seas were particularly noisy and due to what activity. In an ambitious effort, many hydrophone recordings in several sections of the European waters were made, and those taken in the North Sea were offered to the Embassy of the North Sea for artistic use. And the Embassy commissioned a new piece with me, and I started listening again. But what the act of listening brought me this time was a desire to listen even closer. With the anthropogenic sounds being dominant, I wondered, what sounds are we not hearing? What and who are the anthropogenic sounds drowning out? So once again, I decide, decided to make my own field recordings. The North Sea used to be covered in oysters for about 80%. The reason they are mostly gone is because of overfishing. There's actually a record of the last oyster being fished out of the water in the 1960s. The seafloor is now mostly a desert. What you see are the trawling tracks of a fishing vessel. Many efforts are underway, though, along the coastline to bring them back, such as this proposal for placing artificial reefs, because what the oysters in any time of, type of reef building organism needs is a substrate. However, there are, in fact, already many patches of substrate to be found in the North Sea, in the shapes of tens of thousands of ship and plane wrecks, and, of course, the growing amount of structures such as fossil fuel rigs and windmills. And on this map, you can see the black dots, which are wrecks, and the blue dots, which are oil and gas infrastructure, and then finally the red dots, wind turbines. 
And this map was made by Job Kohler for, Job Kohler for his uh, PhD research, and I don't think it accurately shows the amount of um, windmills, because in 2016 they were already planned to uh, increase by 10,000 in the next five years, so they're all realized by now. But it turns out they serve just as well. So they've become little biodiversity hotspots in an otherwise barren seascape. New underwater communities are continuously forming. So I set out to record again with the help of Wageningen Marine Research, and I was able to take recordings at an offshore oyster bank in the south of Dutch waters. And another recording was made by Dutch foundation Duik de Noordzee Schoon, a team of technical divers who take it upon themselves to dive near these structures and remove any debris so that life can continue to thrive. It is extremely difficult to dive in these places. Only a handful of people is equipped to undertake it, with narrow windows of 40 minutes in between tides, rough cold waters and strong currents. They do really amazing work. And they managed to take another recording at a shipwreck loco location far offshore in the north of Dutch waters. What came back greatly surprised me. So the recording sounded like a tropical reef, just a bit less intense, but incredibly similar. The crackling, the snapping, it was all there. What stood out was how every patch of reef seems to have its own unique community and produces its own sound signature. If you now imagine the map that I showed, these kinds of reefs, a hybrid of anthropogenic creation and the emergence of life, must exist all through the North Sea. They go completely unnoticed, are barely documented, and are not protected by law in any way. The technical divers have specialized underwater image making equipment, and so there are snippets of footage of different locations that they visited. The images confirm that the reef have unique compositions. I wanted to convey this imaginative and unknown part of the North Sea while exercising and making the voice of the reefs heard, studying how I could get closer to their ontology. The existing imagery was taken top down at a distance in murky waters with artificial lights highlighting sections. But what would a reef look like to a fish, an oyster or a shrimp? Together with my partner Sasha and a 3D specialist, we worked on creating animated collages based off of the diver's footage. Eventually it got to a point where the boundary between actual and fiction is blurred, using perspectives that alternate between imaginary reef communities and moving with, by and through them. Finally, we developed moving collages that combines multiple animations into imaginary patches of reefs. They are projected onto see-through screens and transducers are attached that transfer vibration of sound, making the screen into one big speaker. The setup allows you to walk up close, listen to each soundscape individually, but the soundscapes together also fill the space. I see it as a speculative reenactment of an ecosystem. An adaption of the work is installed here at Neme, and it's downstairs in the back. I hope if you haven't had the chance to see it yet that you will get to experience it. And then to conclude, with my artistic practice, I aim to move beyond the epistemological methods describing the field I engage with to demonstrate how knowledge may be co-generated with it, and I search for ways to let it speak back. I ask, how can the fundamental coexistence, interdependence, interaction, entanglement with human and non-human companions be uncovered, imagined, and practiced? How can the sea be understood otherwise, beyond scientific data, beyond description? How can the pluriversality of realities that make up the sea be voiced? That's it. Thank you so much for listening.